company, but also it's a very, very big investor and not so known worldwide. Our undoubtedly theme for the investments over the next five to 10, 15 years is ESG, ecological, social and government commitment. And uh, we as Allianz following an international approach, we are following the 17th United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you will find here on the left-hand side. There is uh, environment, there is uh, human rights, there are all that, that kind of things, no need to repeat. We, uh, we want to improve. Yeah. We think, as an investor, it's a very strong weapon we have in mind. There's a very strong tool we have in mind. This is taking care in our investments that we are not passing the money into, into wrong channels, that we are not giving the money to people, to organizations, which make this world, where we all are living together, not a better way. So we <clears throat> think we'll be sustainable insurers, responsible insurers, and attractive employer, young people, me, only want to work where uh, companies are following these international ESG goals, and we want to execute our business as a responsible, as a responsible citizen. We trying as Allianz to channel all our portfolios, and on the colorful picture on the left hand side, these are really huge portfolios into the ESG thinking. We are, and uh, in this circle of, of really experienced managers, I want to say intentionally, we try to invest all in ESG. We have teams all over the world checking. Our investment is this really ESG? Is that what we is, is the company is asking for? Our investments really following this ESG? This is a path we are going. I think we are we, we are started. We are started with the right thinking. We need all support from our employees, clients, and business uh, business partners to uh, achieve the goals we are finally looking for. With that, I do not want to take too much of the time, to spend of the time, and uh, really pass back the word to Tatiana. Tatiana, thank you very much. Uwe, thank you so, so much for illuminating um, your, your ESG strategy and what you're doing. Um, before we go deeper into this, Yayam Chayudar from, uh, from Degrassi Paints and Coatings from India, can you please as well um, set the stage in context of your organization? What does it mean today for you and for your organization? during the purpose um, and, and putting purpose and profit together during the pandemic. Okay, well, uh, Tatania, thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thanks, Horasis, uh, for giving all of us this opportunity to meet and discuss all these important topics during this pandemic. Uh, and uh, thank you all my fellow panelists. Uh, so far as uh, my organization is concerned, it's a startup. You know, it's a three years old startup. And uh, when we are talking about purpose, uh, the entire organization is stand on purpose only. When we started the organization, everything we do as a business is driven by a purpose. So when I say this, you know, we are into the decorative paint business. Now, decorative paints, uh, you know, if you are aware, traditional paints are highly hazardous for human health and environment because of presence of uh, you know, heavy metals and a high volatile organic compound. So when we started this organization, our motto, our purpose was only one, that we will produce whatever our whatever we will produce. Those will be all lead free, means heavy metal free, as well as lowest possible VOC. So our objective, our purpose is to give the right quality product, health hazards free product, and environmentally, environment friendly product to all Indian consumers that we have started three years, three and a half years back. We have not waited for the, some pandemic to, you know, uh, to happen or some you know, regulation has to come. Uh, in all other uh, countries, developed countries like US, like Europe, this regulation of uh, lead free and low VOC paints are already there. But India as a country, the regulation has just come a year back. Hmm. But we as a company, we are the I can say we are the only company in India who has started with this mission from inception and before regulation came in. 
so this is the purpose and all our products all our products are compliant to international standard environment friendly and health hazard free so we are going ahead in this direction so i think this purpose is adding value to the society for the human being uh, you know as a, you know as a whole so now uh, having said so it's not only uh, our company you know though we have done it in the past but uh, during this pandemic during this pandemic lot of companies has taken such uh, initiatives for example you know some clothing company who has uh, you know uh, the wedding dress makers were stopped making wedding dress and converted their uh, facility to make uh, you know uh, the mask uh, the mm. ppe something like that you know mm. then uh, there are some you know perfume makers in india perfume makers they have shifted their production uh, to make sanitizers and uh, as you know the you know the good example is a ford motor company you know ford mm. motor has shifted their production uh, unit uh, to make uh, ventilators Hmm. so these are the few examples where uh, people has really uh, taken uh, the initiative and uh, take the purpose uh, first before profit uh, and 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 uh, try to uh, help the mankind whatever possible way they can thank you so much thank you thank you for um, uh, shedding light on this thank you and um Tetsuya Masabuchi, um, I would love to ask you in, in, in context of High Network Lab and in, Japan, in Asia, how, how does it, um, how is your strategy in context of putting profit and purpose and balancing both um, also during the pandemic, pandemic and, and uh, towards the post-COVID world? What are, what are the, the themes and, and, and the strategies that you are pursuing right now? Yeah. Um... Uh, at first, my uh, I would like to introduce my company. Uh, it's a, named High Network Lab. It's a concierge service company, uh, concierge service lifestyle management service, uh, based both in Tokyo and in Singapore. Uh, so uh, we are proposing for uh, with sorry with uh, uh, around seven thousand. Uh, high net worth clients, families, uh, mainly uh, Japanese high net worth families living in Japan, uh, but some uh, living in Singapore. Uh, and, you know, the Singaporean, Malaysian, Indonesian, expat Japanese mixed. And, uh, yeah, uh, because we are lifestyle management, we are not financial management company. Uh, we are proposing, uh, for example, help finding um, boarding schools of their children or help finding, uh, uh, you know, vintage cars they need or uh, vin uh, some jewelry they need or something like that. And the, um, as you all know, or we, you know, tsunami disaster uh, hit Japan uh, around 10 years ago. And the, uh, we did a survey in uh, among the Japanese high net worth families, uh, you know, the uh, what is the big change before tsunami disaster than the after the disaster? And the two tendencies that come. Uh, one is the uh, they travel longer, and the uh, somebody you know start started to lead a dual life between Tokyo and Singapore, Tokyo and the London, something like that, and the. Uh, somebody uh, lives abroad, and the other one is the, um, you know, or oh, they started to marry, they started to find a partner. I think that is a uh, um, that is simply because uh, they are uh, aware of life is short, uh, or or something like that. And this time in the pandemic period, uh, COVID-19 period, uh, it's a, a little bit different, you know, uh, result we come. Uh, we had a survey uh, this year. And the, they are, this time they are aware of the, they are, um, how do I say, the business owners as well. Uh, so uh, they 
are aware of the, it's quite important to have a business sustainability. Uh, uh, I mean, the, you know, or not just a donation uh, to something, but the uh, help something uh, through their business or something like that. So uh, my point is the, uh, is for the purpose uh, and profit and the purpose uh, comes first and the profit follows. So, but the, uh, maybe uh, I think the Japanese business owners uh, have, have, do not have in mind uh, such a kind of, you know, idea so mm -hmm. far. So uh, it's anyway, still, uh, you know, on the way, but the, uh, this is the uh, great breakthrough uh, as well, or uh, even if we had a severe moment right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for for sharing with us the situation um, in in Japan and and, and in your context. Um, Nahem Kumba um, from the African Development Futures Group, Chairman. Would you um, set the stage in, in context what um, the purpose and profit during the pandemic means for you and for your organization right now? Yeah. So thank you. Uh, also. Uh, Glad to be on the panel with, with all of you, and thanks to uh, Frank and uh, his team for inviting me here again. Uh, so I chair the African Development Futures Group, and uh, we work to advance uh, a science-based development in Africa, STI-based mm -hmm. in Africa. Uh, so I will, I will make a few comments here on, on Asian dynamics, but as a non-Asian, so a little bit, a little bit of, a, of, of an outsider. Uh, ours, ours uh, is a consultancy, and we work with uh, African governments and uh, uh, higher education institutions and scientific research uh, networks to support competitiveness and policies and practices that uh, would would uh, strengthen adoption and uh, mastery of uh, science and technology for development. Uh, coming from uh, an understanding that. Uh, you know, the uh, the world is dominated by those who know science and and and, uh, and can use it, which brings us to uh, to the topic for today uh, about uh, about the pandemic. So some of us have watched the, the Asia have, uh, the rise in the last couple of decades, the, the tigers and China, and see uh, Asia take more center stage as a cluster of, of uh, innovation and uh, and uh, developing uh, economies. And so we see the pandemic pretty much as a shifting or accelerating that that shifting of a, of a center of innovation and the global development towards Asia. Given that uh, it's led you and I now we are on, we are on this platform is digital. So the pandemic has uh, you know occasioned a very very abrupt and quick shift towards digital society, digital economies, digital everything, digital education, everything is online, which means those who have the tools, the capacity, the skills for the digital systems have an advantage over others. And the uh, in infrastructure, human capital, higher education, the centers of research, clusters, all those things mean that people who have those skills more, more than others uh, would, would have a huge advantage post-COVID. And uh, it also brings a big disruption between an old economy and the new economies that are going to be mostly uh, all, all, all virtual. The older economies happen to be mostly Western and non Asian, but the Asian now are capturing. So things are falling on, on their lap uh, pretty much. And we think that uh, it puts a little bit uh, of, a, of a, an opportunity in the uh, Asian business, in the, in the business class. Yeah. So um, uh, we see need for the, the kind of conversations that would bring the... So historically, you've had a Western model that would dominate business and industry. Mm. But then now you, you have things shifting a little bit and Asia taking more and more center stage. Now, what does it mean for the world? What does it mean for the global values that, uh, yeah. that give purpose to business? When we, when we now yeah. say things like, People over profit. What does it mean from the Asian perspective, from the Asian thought process, from the Asian ontologies? So uh, for, for us, it's a matter of engaging our Asian colleagues, 
to say, well, this is an opportunity to develop the kind of thought processes that would help redefine some global dynamics of morality, of corporate, uh, corporate uh, responsibility, of uh, environmental sustainability. What does, what, what does the Asian thought process think about this? And how uh, can we uh, en- enhance that? Develop think tanks that would bring this to fore in terms of yeah. the shift of uh, ec- uh, global economy and power. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is, this is a, a perfect gateway into, into our conversation here, into this group in the next round, building exactly what you said. And I would love just to give um, a little bit of insight um, from, from our um, global CEO study, which um, some, some, some pretty insights in what we've devel- what we've observed over the last couple of months, because we brought together leaders and governments, policymakers behind actually trying to understand what should be and what are the policy recommendations for businesses to transition. Because as much as we go, research shows um, that on the one hand, of course, um, um, putting profit and purpose together or first um, as a strategy, we can, we, can, we can follow that. But we're going through a phase of trade-offs until we go through a phase of balance, until we actually can get into an effect where actually purpose truly accelerates and reinforces um, a profit steering model. In every organization globally, we have different governance systems and the Asian upcoming governance systems are very interesting in this context. Because and what, what we really need to try to understand and what we see is that at a certain point when the ecosystem, the policy ecosystem is as strong as, for instance, we see right now as rising in, 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 in Kenya or in, in Africa, with, with the strategies that they that they follow, um, then it has a huge acceleration in employee engagement and scale for, for the corporation. However, this needs to be obviously mindfully crafted. As we all know, this is a, a transition period we are globally in and our um, in, in the global scenarios that we are facing um, are, are real, particularly with Asia and Africa, as you mentioned, um, with, with um, a with, um, growing um, employment base and um, uh, and through the rapid digitization that we are facing right now and today during COVID and the pandemic and the role of science um, and ESG um, for, for investors, where we also see that right now the deductive approach of ESG measurement is, um, is, is a challenge because we have an inductive approach of organizations and policymakers trying to understand from, from a strategic perspective, how, how to really push the boundaries from a, from, from a policy mechanism um, background, but to truly enable in a meaningful way for purpose first and purpose driven businesses to scale and to assume a broader role of responsibility. What I would love to ask um, in, in this group is, what would you argue based on the strategies that your organizations follow in the context of the Asian markets right now, what are the policy recommendations or the incentives that the Asian markets are already either working on or which are um, needed based on, on, on your experience to really scale the movement so that um, organizations can secure the longevity and have a sustainable way of understanding better how to steer based on purpose for the next 10 years. Maybe, um, Uwe, what is what would be your take on that? Oh, you're muted. Just a second, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I really was feeling that you're asking me, I really was thinking why you're asking, asking back to you. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between, uh, between Europe, the US and, and, and China is that I'm, I'm very happy to answer for this really excellent question, um, um, purpose, um, purpose versus profit and so on. And I, I, think, I think for our company, yeah, our company, and I'm, I'm working for Asia since over 20 years and lived there many, many years. I think first and foremost, we cannot argue there is an Asia. And I think we cannot argue that the thinking of the people in, in, in Asia, what we in the West always think, is similar. We really have to differentiate very, very much so. Um, I, see, I see a lot of, um, 
when talking to, to decision makers, to colleagues in Asia, from the, from the economic side, but also from the political side, there are completely different challenges <clears throat> when you're running uh, a business in India. And that's why it was very, very interesting to hear Yana Jata, what you manage, compared to, to a company in a, in a mature country like in, in Germany. I see very, very positive signs, especially in China, yeah, especially in the, in the environmental side, hmm? where, where, where 10, 15 years ago, we always thought they're polluting in China the world. It's amazing how fast this, um, this special system, how much even, and to name it, the uh, Communist Party in China turned around and is taking now really care for many, many environmental activities. So your question is excellent, but it's also, it's also very, 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 very different to argue. I would really love to hear, before maybe I can have the chance to talk again, to hear uh, uh, Dr. Kumba. You, you have managed, uh, then you look from outside and have a scientific approach, what the people are doing differently. And I found it tremendously inter interesting, Tatsuya-san, what you have mentioned, how the people in Japan changed. I lived during the tsunami and I lived uh, during, during the problems in Tokyo. And I tried to run my, my, my business there. Interestingly, how you describe how the people are changing. I, I, I think, I think uh, we really have to try to get a bit more deeper into Asia because profit versus purpose also has a lot to do with an overall different thinking in the West than in the East, how the people want to structure their lives, what family means, what a specific group means, what individual right means. Huh? Seeing Dr. Kumba nodding, I guess you're just in the US, maybe, maybe even in Virginia, so how important is an individual right and what I'm doing as a, as a single person. I haven't seen that with my colleagues in, 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 in China or in, or, or, or in Vietnam. Um, a very, very good question, Tatiana, and I'm, I'm, I'm not able to answer that, but I'm very much interested to, to listen what the others are saying. I think one thing, one thing I'm absolutely convinced, we have to stop thinking that my Western thinking as a German and Western educated person on purpose and profit, I have to stop to transfer that one-to-one -one into the East. Hmm? And uh, I 100% agree with that you have said that the the, 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 the power game is shifting more into the East. There are more people, there is more thinking, and I think we are doing a good, it's, it's very good for me. It's interesting for me to sit here in that panel, to listen to you and to understand more better what you are thinking on, um, on, on, in, on Eastern thinking. And uh, we are at the beginning of an over, overall global shift. And yeah. uh, it's good for us to try to understand it's not bad, it's not good, but it is good for us to try to understand and try to adapt and try to explain what we, what me in Little Europe are thinking. Thank you very much. I'm talking too long, but uh, it was something which was really very interesting for me. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Uwe, so much. And um, yes, uh, this is this, uh, this, uh, uh, exactly the, the points that, that we should here discuss. And, um, and going to over then to the context of India, um, and, and I think this is another observation um, for us. It's, it's, it's such a it's such a vast majority of culture in Asia and in Africa with very different mindsets of what it means to be purpose driven and purpose first. And this is also what like what does longevity mean in Japan? I know um, is, is is a very strong guide for organizations. Um, but um, Yanta. Could you um, tell us this in context of your market operating and what are you arguing are the, the big incentives which would really allow to scale this transition in, in Asia and um, probably in focus for you on India? Yeah, well, uh, uh, so, so far as Indian perspective is concerned, as uh, uh, you know, uh, he said uh, uh, that wants to understand the Asian's perspective. Now, when we talk about uh, purpose uh, versus profit, and uh, most of the people think that, uh, you know, if we say the purpose comes first, so does it mean that there is no profit? So people think that without profit, there should be purpose. But I don't think so. Without profit, we cannot have purpose. Purpose has to be sustainable. If you don't have profit, how can you sustain yeah. purpose? You know, you can sustain for a year or two, but it it's cannot be a long run, uh, you know, kind of a system. 
so you know the the thinking needs to be changed the understanding needs to be changed it's very simple now the question comes that uh, if you are making profit how you are uh, you know where is your purpose definitely there is a purpose we are also making profit we are having purpose it's a it's a business cycle you know for example if you are having a purpose purpose like you know let's say uh, you know uh, you are reducing carbon footprint you are producing you know solar energy uh, then uh, maybe the you know human trafficking all these kinds of a thing when you are involved in this kind of activity as a company your brand value increases you purely think about from the marketing perspective you know it's a market your brand value increases when your brand value increases your customer loyalty increases when your customer loyalty increases your sale increases when your sale increases your profit increases and when your profit increases and along with all the brand loyalty and brand brand image you get fantastic talents to work with you who take the purpose further so it's a cycle it's a chain so it's not only purpose or not only profit so we have to balance between purpose and profit that's the right way forward that's the, that's the right way forward now coming back to uh, the indian perspective uh, now purpose in what we think in our in our country mainly that uh, we left everything to the government that people think that all the social activity it is only government's responsibility to do it's not it's a wrong understanding it's a wrong idea so people think that there are social enterprises but social enterprises in asia including india are very very minimal and they are not formal mm. not not like us not like uk in asia mm. i can say the south africa is a country sorry south korea is a country where social enterprises are very strong they are formal there are formal social enterprises like us or uk but in other asian is you know like uh, in, uh, japan like india malaysia thailand we are we are we are just taking it forward slowly and steadily so social and unless until we have social enterprises the you know the social work cannot be done it it has to be, it will be like piecemeal basis it's every organization has to have a social message to give has to have a social value and once the message is a social value then government can give a lot of lot of benefits lot of incentives uh, to all the social enterprises incentives like let's say you know tax benefit let's say income tax benefit the lower rate of income tax for all these you know social enterprises uh, you know you may get a concessional rate of power you can get free land uh, uh, as an as an individual basis uh, for for example you as an individual i am an individual if we invest in social enterprises we should get a income tax rebate who are who are who are uh, investing in uh, you know social enterprises kinds of a thing so this is the way uh, the as we rightly he rightly said that asia uh, uh, as such in general is behind than uh, uk us or european countries so far as this purpose is concerned they are right but we are slowly and steadily catching up this uh, it's not only the uh, you know the pandemic in fact uh, the pandemic has accelerated the process we have started doing it few years back this pandemic has really accelerated that process and uh, yeah. now we can see the lot of impact investing what uh, he's he's talking about impact impact investing is happening in fact if you see in indian context the impact investing in the social enterprises the cagr in last 10 years is 26% impact wow. investing means in investment in social sector yes but instead of that to have this sdg you know we are you know that substantial development goal if we the what was the india's sdg goal if we want to achieve that goal we need 0.6 trillion investment further so it's a long road ahead but we are on yeah. the track thank, thank you. you so so much this are uh, this are very insightful um comments that you made and um yeah in and i uh, thank you so much for sharing the recommendations also for policy incentives of what seems to be in the rise on the rise in india but also a very important point that you made um on the one hand um we need to balance profit and purpose but there is no purpose without an understanding of profit um that we, we um, can sustain an organization running um matsuya um if uh, tatsuya if i may um go to the context of japan and to your contacts 
Um, what, what does it mean from your perspective and from a policy background perspective? What are the policies which would scale the development of what is already on the rise or maybe already integrated? What can we learn from the market in Japan and else for the broader context of Asia? And you are uh, muted. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, um, uh, I think in this, uh, you know, anyway, severe situation, uh, we have to be, you know, or we have to be back uh, to the basic or the uh, mm -hmm. think what you can do for now or and for free uh, in the moment. And the, I mean, the, you know, or just doing addition uh, before multiplying is quite important, I think. And by addition based thinking for Japanese people, uh, as you know, the, you know, uh, uh, a great Jap uh, we have some great Japanese people or who were, who had a, uh, you know, a positive presence in Asia, uh, you know, 100 years ago, maybe. In yeah. India, of course, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in, of course, the Hong Kong around there. And the, um, I think the, you know, uh, yeah, we, we are now, uh, we have now ongoing projects uh, named Super Japanese, uh, which is the, what I'm talking right now. Uh, but that is just, uh, how do I say the, Seeing, seeing facts directly and learning learning history deeply uh, is the is the you know or the first step to think about the purpose uh, and the yeah and the profit follows I think and the uh, this is the basics and this is an uh, addition what I say. Uh, but the many, you know, many of my clients helped me uh, to promote, to proceed this project. So, uh, at least I think the this kind of, you know, easy thinking, addition thinking is the, uh, it's it has been hitting the, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, high net worth people or she suites or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the some kind of educated people. Yes, thank you so much. And um, mm -hmm. and as we know, the Japanese pension fund, right, is, is very much um, pursuing um, these kind of strategies for the market as well in a, in, in a very fascinating manner. Um, thank you so much. And um, Nehem Kumba, from your perspective and from the African perspective, and you illuminated already very deeply and based on on your um, background, on the development there on the ground, what would you say is right now from the policy perspective on the rise in, in Africa, where you would say this, go, this goes exactly in the trajectory of enabling businesses on a greater scale to transition, to really play part in this new way of understanding the economy? Oh, uh, so yeah. In terms of uh, of Africa, of uh, um, uh, the 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 leadership of the continent, of all of the four uh, governments, at least uh, three four of them now, they've ratified to create one one continental free trade area, more like more like the European Union as, as, as common market, and uh, that that structure, that free uh, that free trade area, is a structure under which uh, uh, the, the continent is anchoring. Much of its environmental aspirations, so they can have a, a common bargaining um, uh, um, uh, weight and a common a common market, a common a common policy framework, harmonize more, much of the activities, so that uh, the, uh, they can also share resources, right, and, and leverage each other's competencies and average out for the good. So that that mechanism, even around the COVID response, the values, the mechanism for uh, for policy making. Uh, the CDC of um, Africa and all the other uh, governments, they've mostly channeled their work through the, 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 the free trade area. But Africa is a little, uh, you know, has a little, a little way to go. Uh, so one must think that, you know, the Asia, this pandemic is really accelerating, as somebody mentioned, the Asia moment, the Asian century. Yeah. Uh, the West is burdened by legacy. Corporations, the, the oil industries, the uh, 
the industrial infrastructure. Now we are going digital, IT, AI, data intensive uh, systems. And uh, the Asia has their advantage. So you can see even the war between Trump and, uh, and China. It's about, it's about 5G for the most part. What the technology? It's about uh, this, uh, the, 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 the future of, the, of, of technology. So some of us have other questions I want to impress upon our uh, Asian colleagues. This actually also means that the kind of things that uh, we've critiqued about the West for all their, for, for all their strength in the, uh, and, uh, and their weaknesses, when the Asian woman comes, what value do underlie that Asian that, 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 that Asian moment? What 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 philosophical foundations would be there? So um, uh, I understand some government people might be listening to this conversation. So uh, um, um, here in the US, a model that that, that actually helped a lot in improving civil society, uh, improving and including this discourse. That strengthen the uh, the thought processes because saying uh, purpose is one, but what purpose? Yeah. That, that's yeah. very, very deep. This is what I think out of out of my bedroom, right? That's really strong scholarship and strong uh, history and strong overview of these things in a more deeper way. So things like think tanks, things like academic institutions, these are things that uh, you know from uh, industry in in, in, uh, in Asia they can support. So that they can get the kind of thought processes that now enable them to do better what they're calling purpose, right? So, uh, so what happens in India, yeah. what happens in, in, in Malaysia, it might be a little bit different, but quote unquote, they ask Asia, as as uh, Spain and, and uh, Germany, are Europe. So they can become over, over, overarching um, um, uh, commonalities, but with thought processes. So we think uh, strengthening the, the thinking community, the academic community, the research think tanks in Asia, yeah. to have them develop those foundations to answer these questions. I think it might be something that it's a, it's kind of a long term, but not quick fixing as the yeah. today, but provide the foundations for for that for that Asian moment to come. Yes, thank you so so much for for this review, and and um, this is definitely something that will be on the agenda for 2021, where the world would look towards that more closely to your point, and it takes more to bring together, but our time is almost up, and I would love for each of you to have a last comment, a, comment, um, a closing comment in context of our conversation today. What are you taking with you, or what are you wanting to share with the audience in this context? Um, and maybe this time um, we go in a different uh, in a different circle. Um, Ken, what would you say, what is your last closing comment uh, on, on, on the current conversation? Again, I'm still a very consistent. The pandemic has accelerated the Asian moment. And the, the rest of the world is now looking up to Asia for leadership within the region and globally. In the corporate, mm -hmm. in how uh, their foreign policy affects other countries. Is it going to be driven by profit only, the bottom line, or are there going to be some other values that, say, Africa has been colonized and working in Europe and the US might want to do better? How does China relate to uh, an India trade with Africa, for example? What kind of values would animate the world for the next 40, 50 years? Where we, where, where we, where we do something from China, from Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Tatsuya Musubuchi, what from your from your perspective? Yes, Yuyanta? Yeah. OK. Uh, I would say that uh, this time has come to uh, basically shift your organization focus from uh, panic to purpose. Panic now to purpose. everybody is panicked. So our main job is to shift it from panic to purpose. We need to do only three things. What are the three things? Number one, reframe your organization, reframe your capabilities. As I said mm -hmm. that from motor making to ventilator making, reframe your operations for example education sector we can have education sitting at home and lastly as most importantly reframe your relationship for example extending credit terms you know extending rent period uh, you know no layoff to the people increment of salary what we have seen in india asian pens in our uh, in our uh, in our industry they have done all these things so these three things, reframing your capabilities, reframing your organization, and reframing your relationship. Thank you. That will shift panic to purpose. That's all. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, Tatsuya Musubuchi, last comment, closing oh, comment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, whether or not uh, we are in the pandemic period, uh, yes, purpose should come first. And the, uh, the so-called purpose, it's, uh, I think the, it's what's known by many people, known by many, but actually uh, owned by few. Mm. Uh, it's sometimes owned by few. So uh, that's why we have to be, you know, back to the basics always. Uh, you know, the, whether whether or not in the pan, whether or not we are mm. in the pandemic. It's my last comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Uwe Michel, last closing comment here for for our panel from your perspective in the conversation we had. Twenty five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> responsibility and what you tried to from you. Purpose responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this was a fascinating panel with so many different perspectives, which shows there's so much to learn and to move forward in the Asian and African market. And I think we all can't wait. And it really to put our um, stand into what Nakam said, bringing the foundations for 2021 to understanding what this policy look like to scale purpose and profit in, in Asia and, and globally. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I wish you a wonderful rest of your Monday and a great successful week and in a good festive season of, of the end 2020 for each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Natania. Thank you for the Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We do a group, a group, a group selfie. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, group selfie. Yeah. Selfie. Oh, I think take uh, it. Uh, he was in Frank might want to might want to have something like that. <laughs> I don't know how to do it, but uh, I, I understand that's done at the end of the session. I'm, I'm making, I, I was sent us a picture. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Oh, go selfie. Oh, oh. Do this one, yeah. So. <laughs> Confirm group, yes. We in Asia, we are really experiencing that, huh? <laughs> 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 <laughs>